Welcome. Now we will see the talk Multiarch in Debian, six months or six years on with Steve Langashek. So who, who in this room has heard of Multiarch before? And, and who's heard about it sometime in the past three, four years or so? Okay, okay, so. <laughs> Uh, who remembers how long ago we started Multi-Arch? <laughs> those, are, those are the old, old, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, when I say six months or six years on, um, I refer to the fact that for about the past six months we've been actively making progress on Multi-Arch, but um, Here's a quote from, from our good friend Tala Foghen, who I don't know if he's in the audience with us today, but uh, he made a comment that IA32Libs is now the biggest source package in Debian. This quote from Talif I got from the videos from DebConf 5 in Helsinki, 2005 July, which was when we started, actually, well, in fact, it was earlier than that that we started exploring the, the uh, solutions to this problem and the fact that we did not have a good way to retain compatibility with 32-bit um, binaries and 32-bit and, uh, code on 64-bit systems. Um, well, now we've, we've finally gotten to the point where it's worth talking about um, some actual solutions that we've, we've come along with. Um, so yeah, this is a problem that's been known for a long time. The solution is just six years late. Um, or 10 years late, uh, I guess, if by, by some people's reckoning. Um, I, honestly, I don't remember multi-arch being discussed back then, although IA32Libs was a going concern. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so IA32Libs, it's BDL's fault. Um, so <laughs> uh, looking a little bit at the recent history, um, multi-arch was basically stalled for a long time. Um, and in 2009, um, I took a serious look at uh, what we needed to do to try to get things actually moving along. Um, so in May 2009, we did have the, the apt and dpackage maintainers um, attend UDS, the Ubuntu Developer Summit in Barcelona, Spain. Um, and we knocked out a, a specification for how we thought this is going to work at the package manager level. Um, and uh, got, got a good spec out of that. August 2010, we had another follow-up boff um, at DevConf in New York. Um, identified some more issues there regarding uh, how things actually needed to work regarding um, the, the library paths for certain architectures and how the tool chain was going to actually handle this um, because we realized that, oh, the architecture name that uh, the tool chain uses is not necessarily uh, the right thing for uh, a, a perfect multi-arch world uh, in all cases. So then come February 2011, um, over the period of about two months, um, and thanks to the sponsorship of Lenaro, um, Dpackage multi-arch landed in Ubuntu, so we had for the first time um, a distribution using an actual implementation of Dpackage that uh, uh, could install side-by-side -side libraries for uh, multiple architectures, provided that the library packaging was done according to the package manager spec and everything would actually play together. Um, March 2011, the directory names that we'd come up with the previous summer, we decided to get rid of <laughs> and came up with a different solution. Um, April, Ubuntu 11.04 released with multi-arch support in the distribution. It was not enabled by default. Nobody was actually uh, um, exposed to this as, a, as a, an ordinary user, but the support was there in the, in the package manager and um, about um, 100 libraries, give or take, um, were available that uh, had, uh, had been converted for multi-arch and it was enough to actually install the 32-bit flash plugin uh, package on an Ubuntu 11.04 system, if you enable a PPA and twiddle a few knobs, the, uh, this, this just worked and you didn't have any 32-bit package being installed by a AMD64 package and, and all that, that goodness that is why we love IA32Lib so much. Um, and today, uh, in July of 2011, um, most of those patches from Ubuntu 11.04, well, in fact, all of the patches have been uh, sent back to Debian at this point. Um, and not all of those have actually been applied yet. Some of them are in the BTS at the moment, waiting for the maintainers to upload, because I think I was still pushing some of those patches when I was on the uh, train here 
Anyway, um, but in fact, there's, there's now 135 of them in Debian and Unstable today that are, that are all set up for that. And, uh, you know, the numbers are growing. So who knows? Who knows what, uh, what the people in this room will do between now and tomorrow? Maybe that number will go up a little bit. We'll see. Um, so before going into the technical details of, of the actual implementation and talking to you about what, uh, you know, what we're doing with MultiArch right now, I want to highlight MultiArch as an example of how to and, and how not to make large changes to Debian that require coordination between many different maintainers. Because over its 10-year history, it has served as both. Um, part of why we stalled out, well, there are many reasons why we stalled out. But let, let me look at a few key lessons that, that I, I think are the takeaway from MultiArch and hopefully can be instructive to people here if they have changes that they want to make to the, the distribution so that they don't you know, run afoul of, of some of the same problems we had early on. Um, and one of the things that, that was crucial to actually getting MultiArch finally on its feet was having a written spec that recorded the shared understanding that, that we'd come up with in, in uh, Barcelona to say how this was actually supposed to work. Um, and that was important um, for a number of reasons. It meant that when we were talking to other people in the community, we had something we could refer back to. Um, it meant that three months after we'd actually agreed on something, we could refer back to it ourselves and actually remember the conversation we had. Um, in fact, the, the, um, the apt implementation um, was a summer of code project in 2009, um, and the, uh, David Kalnischkis has done a, uh, just an outstanding job of getting multi arch support into apt, the higher level package manager. And uh, the work he's done there, um, stellar, but he did happen to overlook a particular bit that we documented regarding how we handle architecture all packages. Um, which we then had to go back and you know, fiddle with after the fact. And it was important to, to have captured that because otherwise none of us would have remembered what we were talking about when we wrote that. Um, so written specs, splitting your work into bite-sized deliverables is another important thing here. Uh, you know, uh, going into Barcelona, one of my goals was to pare down the scope of multi-arch to something that we could actually achieve in a reasonable amount of time. That we could go out and say, okay, well, what's, what's the minimal thing we can do that, that gets us over the, over the hump as far as delivering this? And so we, we said, okay, there's all this great stuff about cross-compilation and, you know, partial architectures and all these other things that, that have come up in the, in the long discussions around multi-arch about wonderful things that this would open the door for. But if we tried to tackle all of that at once. We would spend all of our time talking about it and never actually get around to implementing anything. So the, the, the spec that came out of, of uh, the Ubuntu Developer Summit was, here's how you install two shared libraries side by side and how to make it work, and that's it. Um, and by, by really trimming that down and just you know, making sure we had a good solid spec for that, um, it was something that we could go out and implement, and, and that's been done now. Uh, and also making it clear how other people can help. Um, so there have been people who have been early adopters of MultiArch for their library packages. Um, we had, in fact, even in the, not sure if in the Lenny release, but certainly in the Squeeze release, there were a couple of libraries that had already started using the MultiArch uh, paths, um, despite the fact that, you know, they wound up not actually being finalized and we had to make some changes after the fact, which was fine because it was out there and, and it had actually, it had, the support for it had already been put into eglibc and uh, GCC in an earlier iteration, so we were pretty much committed to providing compatibility for that in any event. Um, and, uh, but the fact that there was documentation out there and, and people could go out and do it without having to wait for some sort of central committee to, to I don't know, <coughs> do it for them or, or tell them one by one it's your turn to do this, the fact that people can, can actually just jump in and work on this stuff is, is it been a, a, a huge huge benefit. Um, and so this, this wiki page up here, um, I'm not a big fan of wikis in general um, because I find that they are, it's too easy for them to drift over time. Um, but this is exactly the sort of thing I do think that wikis are useful for in the Debian context is you have the mailing list discussion, um, you work through exactly what all the issues are, and you use them as a place to capture specifications or, or documentation which exists as a, as a permanent record instead of having people have to dig through the, uh, the mailing list archives and have people tell them, oh, okay, well, you know, go back 
six months or six or seven months, I don't remember exactly what month it was, into the archive and look up this thread that had these two people talking on Debian Develop. That's, it doesn't work very well when you do it that way. So the more we summarize the things that we, we actually do understand, and this is kind of coming back to using written, written specs, because wiki documentation is, in a sense, a form of, of a spec in many cases. Um, that goes a long way to, to lowering the barrier to entry to this kind of thing. Another uh, key lesson, and none of these things are, are particularly earth-shatteringly uh, insightful. Um, these are all kind of obvious if you think about them, but I'm laying them out there anyway. Um, there's nothing so permanent as a temporary solution. <laughs> I, we, we were having the conversation in, in the, the hack lab just the other day, and, and I made a comment about, uh, well, IA32Libs was always intended to be a stopgap, and Colin's reply was, well, yes, it, it was a stopgap. It was just a very, very large gap. <sighs> so now that, now that we've, we've gotten here, all this, this, all this time waiting and, and the work that's been done on, on the, the tool chain, on, on eglibc, on the package manager, what does it actually get us? Why is multi-arch actually relevant? Why do we care about it? Well, there are a number of things that it does for us. It gives us cheap emulated environments, um, which allows you to only emulate the parts that need to be emulated. Um, so basically you can throw whatever you're emulating. Say you're doing QEMU emulation to test out mono to see what it does when you run it on ARM. Well, rather than having to have a full ARM system image or whatever, and, and it, your emulation is going to be slow enough as it is, um, why slow it down further by, uh, and make it more bloaty by having to have a full chroot or a full system image that uh, emulates the entire thing if you can just install the ARM mono package and have everything else running x86 and only emulate the thing you're actually trying to debug. So cheap emulated environments, emulate only the parts you need to. Um, another thing that this does, which is important to a lot of people, um, is cross-compilation is no longer special. You get it for free because cross-compilation and, and uh, native compilation are no longer different. They, they are, they're, they're, we no longer have this special hierarchy under slash user where you install your cross-build environment. Um, and as a result of that, uh, you know, the, the, all the specialness to cross-compilation kind of just falls out of the equation for the most part. There are a few things where you know, some build systems have something special, but in 90% of the cases, um, it just it, it becomes a non-issue anymore. So uh, when we deployed this in Ubuntu, we had to deal with CMake breaking because of the path changes. In the process of fixing CMake so that it could deal with the fact that your, your libraries are not necessarily under user lib anymore, they're in a subdirectory, and to deal with the fact that headers might not be under user include but in a subdirectory, well, the logic to tell it what subdirectory that's in happens to work, whether it's a cross-compiler or a native compiler. So as a result of this, CMake cross-compilation com, com, uh, cross of anything using CMake pretty much just works as a result of that. Now, uh, the actual details of the patches, we've gone through a few revisions of those um, to get that upstreamed, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's just a uh, automatic um, cross-compilation savings. Now, some of you may not be uh, in, the, in the practice of doing cross-compilation today. Um, so you may be wondering why this is actually relevant to you. So who in here uh, maintains a package? Okay. Who in here has had one of those packages fail to build on ARM or MIPS? Or M68K. <laughs> uh, and who has logged into the Debian Porter machines for ARM or M68K or MIPS in order to debug that? Who enjoyed that experience? <laughs> Who enjoyed that experience and didn't have root on the box to be able to install their own build depths? <laughs> ah! <laughs> so the process for debugging build failures for packages in order to, to have the portability that we value in Debian historically takes a lot of, you know, uh, these centralized resources that have to be shared and, and managed by someone doing work to make sure the build, the build environment is available, configured, has, has the, the, the build dependencies you need in order to get on with debugging. 
if you have a cross-compiler -comp available and, and you can easily do this on your own system, well, you don't need that hassle of, of SSHing to another machine and, and asking for build dependencies to be installed and waiting for it to build on a very slow native environment processor. You can, you can reproduce a lot of these issues on your own systems. So, you know, if you ever run into the case where your package is being held out of testing because upstream changed something that regressed on this architecture that you're not actually all that familiar with, um, and is very actually slow to, to compile and reproduce things on, you can save yourself a lot of time by doing a cross-compiler cross and, uh, and just dealing, dealing with it all locally. Um, and in some cases, you know, maybe you still need to actually have a real system of that type to reproduce the, the last bit of the build failure on because you're trying to run some code at the end and it only fails on this machine. But then you've got your binary built instead of the, the, the build D having thrown it away as part of its true cleanup at the end of the, the failed build. You've got your binary and you can just dump it over there. And you can also iterate it faster because cross compilers for some of these systems, it's a lot faster to do this, this compilation work on your, your x86-64 laptop with a super fast disk and lots of memory. So you do it all in tempfs temp and everything else than it is to go to some, uh, you know, uh, ARM system that has a USB disk and 512 meg of memory. And, and it's just, it, they're, they're very, obviously there are some differences here where Cross-compilation cross is a win, and not just for people who are actually, you know, developing for those, those architectures as porters. Um, it also gets us cross-grading. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the comment there is that, well, if you look in the history of, of multi-arch in Red Hat, where um, after they deployed this, they, they had some bugs reported by users who had inadvertently switch their systems with, a, with an RPM command or whatever um, from one architecture to another without meaning to, and things broke. My answer to that is if, if we managed to get those bug reports, we've won. Um, because this is it's actually a very useful thing to, to uh, be able to cross-grade in some cases. Um, over the lifetime of this, the discussion of multi-arch, we've had architecture transitions where we've moved from one ABI to another where it might have helped. I mean, so ARM to ARMEL was a transition. Now, the, the machines you're doing the transition on, most of them didn't have a whole lot of disk space, and, and it may not necessarily have been all that useful for many of these machines to, um, to try to upgrade or to tr try to cross-grade from one architecture to another in place. Uh, for many of these machines, it was still going to be faster to just do a reinstall. But having the capability would have been nice. It would have allowed, um, you know, uh, testing some of this out in a... In a more, uh, more of a smooth transition, a gradual transition, test one bit at a time, um, and that's a good tool. And obviously for x86, there's no such reason why we would prefer to reinstall instead of, of uh, doing a cross-grade. In fact, lots of people have said, you know, I'm running 32-bit because I installed the machine on a disk 20 years ago, and I don't want to actually have to go about creating a new file system and running the installer again, so I'm on 32-bit. Uh, even though they've moved that disk from one machine to another and, and or, you know, they've, they've, they've moved that file system from one disk to another and the machine it's now running on is actually 64-bit, but they're not taking advantage of it. We also have in the near future, we have ARMEL versus ARMHF as a, a pair of architectures um, which are compatible at the kernel level, but not at the user space ABI, um, where having this capability would again be nice. Um, it also gives us better support for binary-only software. Um, now, there are, there are mixed opinions in the Debian community about whether this is, this is something that we actually want to support. And a lot of people think that, well, binary software, that's, that's only for those people who, who um, haven't seen the light and, and run 100% uh, um, free software on their systems. But here's the thing. This is work that we are already doing as a project. It's, it's in the social contract as the, regarding that we will commit to making our system suitable for using uh, non-free software on top of, even though we're not necessarily going to spend a whole lot of effort on it. But as a community, we have decided that there are cases where it's important. That's why we have this IA32 loops package that's been in the archive forever, and year by year it grows a little in order to support some of these use cases which we don't have any other way to handle on AMD64. And, and as a community, we've, we've, never said, we've never said, okay, we're gonna throw IA32 libs out because it's so ugly that we don't want to support it. So instead, we have this wart on the archive, which 
I don't know if anybody knows how big the package is in, in, uh, in Debian. I know the source package in Ubuntu is over 650 meg of a source package. So the source package does not fit on a CD. Um, imagine trying to maintain that and, and think about what kind of maintainability that actually gives you for that package um, in, in support of uh, something that is an important use case to a lot of users. Um, even if those of us in this room don't want to use the non-free flash or, or Skype or Wine or care about these things, those packages are in the archive for a reason and it's because users do use them. So having a better way to support those without making a mess of the supportability of the archive is, is very important. So what can you do to move, to, to move multi-arch forward? So same link to the wiki that I gave before. Um, it gives all the details about how to convert a shared library, which is the, the common case for a package that is going to need some work to, to um, adapt to this new multi-arch world. Um, and this is not something that you have to go run out if you're a library maintainer and, and immediately convert your library. Um, if you do, that's great. I mean, people have done that. I, I, I keep being amazed by some of the libraries when, when I was collecting the numbers for this talk about um, um, how, many, how many packages have been converted in Debian. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's such a strange library to be converted and, you know, it's, it's there, it's done. Um, but this, this wiki page gives basically step-by-step -step instructions on how to, to do the conversion for most of the common build systems that are in use today in, in uh, the Debian archive, um, including a, if you're not using a build helper, this is how you would want to approach that. Um, so we have this new interface in dpackage architecture, um, which you can use to query the, the correct subdirectory name that you're going to use. Uh, and Policy has already been updated for this. That there's a, an exception to the FHS, which allows us to say, yes, we want you to use these, li these, these directories for shipping your libraries, which includes both the shared libraries, um, static libraries can be moved as well, your .so sim links, your package config files, .la files. Um, and if you, if you have a shared library that, that uh, loads DSOs of any kind, where it, it, the library has plugins, well, you're gonna need to move those as well because otherwise your plugins, if they're under user lib slash foo, and you try to install plugins to make both, of the, both versions of the library work usefully, you again have a file name collision. So those also have to be moved over. Um, and handling that is going to require some, some kind of coordination between the related packages. You can do that using breaks. If you've got a small number of packages and you know it's a small self-contained set um, and you just want to get it over and done with, upload them all at once, breaks against the, the uh, old versions, and, and, and you're done. Um, alternatively, in some cases, particularly if it's a library that might have um, third-party plugins provided by somebody not shipping the packages in, in Debian per se, it may be useful to do some sort of a pa uh, patch to the software so it looks in the, both the old and the new paths on a transitional basis. Um, now, obviously, if it finds something in user lib, that something that it finds there is not going to be available for both architectures, but at least it means you have, a, again, a smooth, gradual transition. Um, now, you also have the case where uh, you might have um, helper binaries that are being used by the, uh, the library, um, where for whatever reason the, the library, be that as part of its maintainer script or, um, you know, Examples escape me at the moment, other than libc-bin, in fact. But um, if you've got helper executables that are built as part of the, the, the library, um, you probably don't want to put a separate copy of, of those in the, the multi-arch library directory for each one of those because you really only need one. It's an executable. If you can execute it, it does its job, and hopefully it's architecture independent in what it does for you, and you don't need multiple copies. Um, in which case, in fact, policy already says helper binaries don't belong in the shared library package because that already breaks um, SO name changes. Um, now, this is just one more reason why we should, we should uh, split those out and, um, and those can be left in user live in a separate package. So packages that are dependencies of shared libraries um, because they ship data or executables, those packages, once you've split those out, uh, it's important if you're going to have them work in a multi-arch environment that they be marked as multi-arch foreign. Um, so multi-arch, in, in the process of exploring this, the question of how to make these, this all work in the package manager, 
uh, we identified that there are, in fact, several different kinds of dependencies that we need to be able to handle. Um, there's, there's the case where one package depends on another because it links to it and you have to load it into memory and uh, obviously the code has to be of the same type because you're not going to you know, mix and match um, object code of different kinds in the same process uh, memory space and, and have that work. So that's one kind of dependency. Another kind of dependency is I call this thing, it's an executable, I run it, and it does something for me, and, and the, the interface there is the basically an exec boundary. Um, that's a different kind of dependency. Uh, those may be the only two cases. Um, I guess the, the third kind is uh, I, I depend on this thing, but I don't actually care about multi-arch for such and such a reason because I am the only thing in the world that does this and it only exists for one architecture. More or less the, the, the binary only case or the I've not been ported to anything other than I386 case. Um, so in order to, to distinguish between those dependencies in the package manager and have the package manager always do the right thing with the dependencies, that means we do have to annotate them and distinguish between what kind of dependency am I. And what we looked at was the fact that the, the most efficient way to annotate this for the common case was to mark the package being depended on to say what kind of package am I. So a package which uh, provides an interface that is not an ELF um, library interface, it should be marked as multi-arch foreign if anything that is a library that you want to have two of installed at the same time depends on it. So this is multi-arch foreign and um, if you maintain any uh, binaries in kind of the base system. You've probably already received some bug reports from me asking you to add that field to your package. Um, and now one of the interesting things about this, this uh, multi-arch foreign field is intuitively we would not think we would want to do this for uh, a package which is architecture all. You would say it's already architecture all. That means it's architecture independent. Uh, so we don't need to add any additional information. We can just use that fact. Well, there are a few cases where it matters. Thankfully, we wrote this spec <laughs> to capture that so we could remember what those cases are. So if you're interested in that issue, it's documented in the spec and see, see previous comments about the importance of written specs. So that's basically it as far as, as what, what we need to be doing right now to implement multi-arch and, and, uh, and make things work. It's, uh, I'm happy to, to, to go into more detail with people individually on that, but I, I do not intend this talk to be a tutorial per se because I intend the wiki documentation to be complete. So if you find that the wiki documentation doesn't answer your questions, ask them and then I am happy to add the answers to the wiki. But uh, the next question is, is what lies ahead? Where, where are we going from here? So the, the shared library question is pretty much solved as far as what we're doing and how we're getting there. Um, but there are, there are other things that, that are on the, the roadmap, more or less, which are important to people. So I, I mentioned earlier that uh, the, the dpackage multi-arch implementation was sponsored by uh, Linaro, uh, which is a, a industry consortium which uh, focuses on improving the state of the art of Linux on ARM. And of course, the reason they're interested in this is because of dev packages. So we kind of want to get to the point where Dev packages can also be installed and used in a, in a multi-arch environment um, and do some cross-compilation -comp support there. Now, I do actually have a demo which I'm going to talk over. That's not the right thing. Where is my scroll back? There we go. So, um, I figured I'd put together a little bit of, of a demo of a, of a slightly hacked together cheroot um, doing cross-compilation of a package. Um, and unfortunately, the package I picked for my target once I started timing it um, is quite quick. So let's do this. It takes longer to install the build dependencies for it, even from the local cache, than it does to, to cross-compile the package itself. Now, the, on, on the auto builder, the last time this package built, it took about seven minutes. If you see the, the output here, it's, it has a list of colon RML packages that's going out and downloading according to what I've specified that I need. Um, the, the truth I'm installing this into right now has a few bits that have been fiddled with by hand. 
Um, libc 6 dev currently is not quite at the point where we can co-install two of them. We, we've just done, uh, Aurelian and I have done some patches um, uh, just, just this week to make that happen. Um, because there's, not all of the glibc headers are the same on each architecture and if they each want user include, that doesn't work. So there's a little bit of moving things around that has to be done for, for uh, libc. But you see we're unpacking all this stuff. Um, once you've got that base level sorted out by hand, most of the rest of it just kind of works, um, at least for one architecture at a time, even though many of these packages have not yet been fully uh, multi-arch enabled, at the, 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 the dash dev packages have not been multi-arch enabled. Um, but the, the runtime packages have been, so the fact that I'm only installing one uh, dev package at a time because I'm only building for one architecture at a time means it happens to just work. So we are, this is kind of a, a rigged demo in that sense because it's not fully multi-arch dev, but uh, it's close enough. And we will eventually have, in fact, um, uh, David Kalnischikis has also uh, committed this week a patch to implement apt-get build dep dash a architecture, which is not the same thing as apt-get dash o apt architecture such and such, because when you're cross-building things, you actually have to distinguish between the build dependencies that you need to run and the build dependencies you need to link against. So again, you have to know the difference between your host and your build architecture and do the right thing. So that's actually already implemented in apt-get. Um, but I'm not using it today because we don't have enough information in the dev packages to correctly mark them as multi-arch um, to, to make that work. But, you know, we're talking a minute and six seconds to, to install the build dependencies. Obviously, I am talking much longer than, than it takes to run the demo. Uh, the the cross-compilation requires just a, one more little bit, which is the, you, know, you have to have a, a cross-compiler installed, and I'm, I'm using the, the ARM cross-compiler, which is available in Ubuntu. This is a, an Ubuntu Oneric root. Um, so there is an ARM, uh, an x86 to ARM cross compiler available in the Ubuntu archive. And uh, you see that I have not finished this sentence and um, we've already finished the compilation. So uh, that's pretty much it for the, the package build. Um, and, you know, I, I should have picked Mesa or something so I could um, explain it all in the time it takes to cross compile. But uh, yeah, it, cross compilation, it, it really does, does make a difference um, to, to building some of this stuff and being able to iterate things rapidly. Uh, it, it, there's lots of use cases for cross-compilation, so it's really very exciting. Uh, so that's one of the things is, is how do we get the dash dev packages there so we can automate a lot of that. Um, and that means having all the, the dash dev packages installing where they need to um, so that we can co-install them and so also that apt can figure out what kind of package it is and do the right magic when installing build dependencies. Uh, so we already can move the .so, .la, .ac, .a, .pc files uh, when, we, when we move the shared libraries, provided you even have any .la files anymore since this breaks the uh, libtool.la references and so we're, it seems that we're kind of removing a lot of those in the same, at the same time we're moving things to multi-arch. But uh, it, it, this is not enough in the general case to be able to say, that, yes, this, this dev package is now multi-arch colon same and can be used in that manner because sometimes we do have architecture dependent uh, headers. And there are cases for that where you have an auto-generated header that pulls in bits at build time based on architecture. That's the, the common case for that. Uh, and, and this is not, not uncommon by any means. Um, some, some particular libraries have already dealt, dealt with this on their own, such as GTK, glib, those kinds of things have their own architecture dependent headers, which they already install under user lib and use package config to connect the dots and make those headers available when you're building. Um, and, you know, multi-arch does not obsolete that simply because the, the way you install GTK and, and glib and the, the header paths that are used, they deliberately add a, an additional subdirectory to, so that you could, you could co-install uh, multiple versions side by side, multiple versions of their headers and their development packages side by side. So as a result of that, the package config still has its uses in those cases. And uh, it's not like multi-arch means, oh, we'll move it all into user include now. But there's a lot of, there are a lot of libraries that do not uh, do this today. And as a result of that, it's, there's some, some work we have to do to figure out what the best practices are as far as what headers we're going to move, what headers we're going to leave in place. There's a, there's a very clear trade-off here between um, 
the work the maintainer has to do to maintain um, the, the package and, and keep track of architecture dependence of headers versus disk space used on the end. Now, for most dev packages, header files are, are a, very mi a very small percentage of, of the package size because if you've got a .a file in the package that, you know, the rest is just nothing. Uh, but it, so it may be that we'll decide what we want to do here is just say, if it's a multi-arch package, just put all the headers under the subdirectory and call it good. This does break compatibility with some things that are not multi-arch ready yet, uh, including some upstream software. So as we do this, we will have to, to contend with that as well. Uh, but you know, this is, this is the, one of the next steps that we're, we're going to be tackling here. Um, we have a long list of libraries to convert in order to be able to drop IA32 libs. And we are working through that gradually. Um, and when I say we, I mean collectively. And it's not just uh, some sort of coordinated uh, effort. These things, I, I, you know, I mentioned that we had like, 84 libraries in, in Ubuntu. Um, those patches have all been pushed into Debian, except for about 20 of them, which spontaneously appeared multi-arched without me having any opportunities to send the patches up before they got done by the maintainer. So as soon as the floodgates opened, uh, you know. <laughs> so it's really great to see this moving forward. Um, but in addition to the, you know, there's a long list of libraries we have to deal with before we can actually get rid of all of IA32 libs. But the other thing we can do is we can uh, start picking off the reasons that IA32 libs are on users' systems by taking the reverse dependencies, looking at the libraries they actually need, taking a small set of those and, and one small wedge at a time, clearing those out so that, so that IA32 libs doesn't, uh, doesn't have to be installed uh, unless you're using basically wine, I think, is the big offender there. So, sorry. Wine is an offender in many cases. Maybe I shouldn't have repeated that on the mic. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, and I'm happy to, to help identify some of those lists of, of packages that, that are uh, candidates for conversion, the, the low hanging fruit, if anybody wants to help with that and is interested in doing some work on patching those. Um, the other thing that's going on is we do still have to get the multi-arch support merged into dpackage mainline. Um, it is in the Ubuntu dpackage. Uh, it has not yet been merged into the Debian dpackage. It's still under review by the, the dpackage um, primary maintainer, lead maintainer. Uh, and that's going on in parallel. There's no reason why we need to stop the work we're doing on library conversion waiting for that. This is something that we can, we can be making good progress in all these libraries so that the day that dpackage is ready to go, IA32libs disappears from the archive. Um, now, the other thing we're going to want to do is once, once dpackage is ready to go, uh, in order to make use of that and get rid of IA32 libs from the archive, we have to look at how we're going to deal with the fact that now AMD64 is missing some packages in the AMD64 packages file. So your i386 packages file that you want to be available in the common case, we're going to have to decide if we're going to enable that by default or, or what we want to do there. Uh, there are a few bugs to sort out with eglibc, um, nothing too major, just a small issue where you, if you happen to install a biarch uh, eglibc package which exists today and combine it with certain multi-arch versions of eglibc that you can clobber your libraries in slash lib with the wrong version because it follows a symlink called slash lib64. And we have some ideas about how to, to clean that up, all of which are um, terrifi terrifying. But... Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think anybody in the room here minds if um, the path to their ELF interpreter disappears temporarily while we're in the middle of this. It's, it's a... <laughs> uh, yeah, we also, there, there are, there's some work we have to do here to make, make uh, multi-arch usable for upstreams because, you know, this is, this is something that perhaps other people who had been involved thought this through better than I did. Um, and understood better than I did what I was getting into. Um, they did not communicate that to me in a way that I was understanding at the time. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you run into these things like, oh, well, um, you have a multi-arch libc 6-dev, so you want to have two of them installed, which means the file, the, the path user lib crti.0 is no longer available because you can only have one of those at a time which means that if you're trying to do upstream compiler development, um, those compilers have to be multi-arch aware. 
because they need to be able to find find that kind of thing. It's it, yeah, compilers and and upstream build systems. Um, we've we've kind of worked through this with a couple of upstreams already, where you know, CMake, um, the CMake maintainer in Debian has been has been uh, very proactive in in addressing this for for that package. Um, Python, um, we're trying to address this. The, one of the things that's missing right now is to have a generic non-Debian interface to figure out what the right multi-arch path is. Um, so this is one of these things that we're going to be working through and trying to, to talk with the right people in, in other distributions and in the appropriate standardization bodies to uh, develop these, these cross-distro in, um, interfaces for that. So that's, that's what's on the radar. That's, that's, the last slide was basically my to-do list, which I will happily share and chunk out to other people as, as they desire. But... Uh, even beyond that, there's a lot more that we can do with multi-arch. This, this basically comes down to the um, break it down into bite-sized pieces. Well, all of that, that was the bite-sized piece that we could do for the initial implementation. Now that that's out of the way, more or less, there's this whole range of things that, it, that these are the things people have been talking about for years that wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't, wouldn't multi-arch be great because it would solve X for us. Well, it, it you know, now we have to have those conversations because now it's actually feasible. And it's really, it's about the policy that we want to have for how this stuff is supposed to work. It's not about the implementation. Um, we have to decide what do we do with, um, with an AMD64 architecture that happens to use a 32-bit legacy bootloader on systems that use a BIOS. Should we actually have an AMD64 Grub PC package? Or should we actually have the AMD64 image reuse the one that was built natively for i36? Um, just to give one example, I mean, th this, is, this, is, this is only one example, and it's one I'm familiar with, but there are other packages in the archive where we are build depending on GCC-multilib in order to build an AMD64 package with GCC-M32 um, for no other reason than that it's the only way to get the 32-bit non-portable to 64-bit executable on your system. Uh, so things like that, and, and I'm, I'm very... Uh, very much looking forward to having those, those discussions with, uh, with the community, and I think we're going to try to have a, a boff after this today um, to talk with like, the build D maintainers and the FTP masters and the release team and whoever else uh, is available to try to sort out what kind of policy we need to have in order to make this, this kind of thing achievable in the archive. Uh, yeah, partial architectures. That's going to be a lot of fun when we can start actually having some of those. Although people keep trying to promote the partial architectures to full architectures. Um, they keep finding reasons that the, the, old, uh, the old wisdom that you don't need a full 64-bit port on these architectures because the, all it does is take more memory and not run any faster. So you only care about a few libraries. Well, keep, people keep finding new things. Oh, so I'm uh, out of time, unfortunately. So, you know, the future of multi-arch is basically up to you. Um, do with it what you want. Make it great. <laughs> And I will take, uh, I guess, uh, only a couple of questions, perhaps, or one question. Hello. Uh, my name is Marcelo. I'm, I'm really new at this. So do you have something, like a tip, to beside all of it? I don't know, for a really, really new person. I don't know. A, a tip for a new person? Yeah. Uh, no, you, and uh, a key point. I don't... I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm really new. I'm sorry. Um, but I like it. I, I will read it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will try to have fun with it. And uh, I'm sorry if uh, so, I'm taking the time. So I guess, I guess uh, my... my my tip for new person is avoid maintaining libraries because it's a it's a it's a bottomless hole that you will never get back out of. So, Steve, you are, you mentioned the word wine before. Actually, as um, doesn't uh, or can't we have the idea with multi arch or say well, actually, wine is just another another API interface, so it really should be not be handled as wine on EC86 or AMD64, but to have the popular solution. Uh, so you are proposing that we will start up a new partial architecture in Debian, which... Uh, doesn't, doesn't 
doesn't it sound <laughs> the correct technical answer? I mean, it's nothing, nothing for today or tomorrow, but... That sounds great. Let's talk about that. <laughs> well, there are a lot of packages, for example, that, that if you follow Vine using Vine tricks, you just download some Windows builds of, of an unzipper from some unknown websites, which actually we could just compile in Debian natively for that other API, which would, of course, be way more correct way to do it. Like uh, 7-zip or RAR or anything else like that. Steve? Thank you, seriously. As one of the few people who has uploaded IA32 libs, thank you. <laughs> And, you know, I do need to call out the fact this has not been a, a one-man effort, although I'm the one standing up here giving the talk because apparently I am the, the glory hound or whatever I am up here. There are a lot of people who have, who have contributed to making this happen. Um, you know, Aurelien and uh, Matthias for the, for the tool chain and, and EGLibc, David Kalnischkis and Michael Vogt working on the apt implementation, um, Raphael Herzog and uh, Guillaume Jovert working on the dpackage implementation, just to name a few of the people who have, who have been so instrumental in, in making this happen. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is a, a group effort and, and you should all be very proud of what, what uh, has been accomplished here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a long time coming, but our answer, finally, the, the, the implementation uh, knocks the socks off of the RPM one. Um. <laughs> Thank you, Steve.